I, I, you, you may have forfeited your, uh, your next citation in dissent. I don't know. But, um, I was happy but to get one. Don't yes. worry. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I thought that was an, uh, an excellent back and forth. Uh, I'd like you to prepare your, your questions. So be ready in a, in a second to think about uh, questions that you'd like to direct to Joanne and Rick. I, I want to just ask one of both of you and, and give you a little chance to, to respond to Joanne. Um, are there any public policy implications to your um, your views on uh, the role of foundations in education. So, Rick, it sounds like you're you're fairly satisfied with the with the way things are set up now. So maybe maybe there wouldn't be responses. But I think, in particular, Joanne, your comments beg the question: You know, how should public policy be changed uh, to to uh, facilitate the the role of foundations promoting democracy um, more than they more than they are today? Okay. Um, uh, let me start by responding to some of the things that this Rick said. <laughs> uh, first about uh, conspiracy and conspiracy theories. Actually, the only people that I've ever heard mention conspiracy um, are pro-ed reform people accusing those of us who are critical. So uh, what I mean by that is for me, um, the ed reform movement is no more a conspiracy than the environmental movement is a conspiracy. These are broad coalitions. They are heterogeneous. But there's a general agreement on some basic principles and also a gener general agreement on a lot of policies, not all of them. And Rick did point out that um, Walton supports vo vouchers, Broad, and, uh, and Gates don't, and a lot of the others don't. But aside from that, there is a lot of overlapping agreement, but definitely no conspiracy. When people operate together uh, in a democracy, it's a movement or a coalition. Conspiracies are, by definition, secret and illegal. And the Ed Reform Movement is not a conspiracy. Now about motivation. This is tricky because I think it's fair to say that all of these people who are involved um, in the Ed Reform Movement have good motivations, but they define good. I think it's silly, actually, to talk about motivations. Um, I'd never question what the Gates' motivations are. You know, if there are psychological motivations, I have no idea what they are. Uh, and um, if the people in the Walton Foundation think that vouchers are a great idea, um, they're motivated to do good when they support vouchers. Um, so I disagree about getting into motivations altogether, and I've never questioned anyone's motivations. Then just about the $600 million, billion dollars that the federal government spends on... Federal, state, and local. Oh, okay. That's everybody. Okay. I was wondering why it was so high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's only about 10% federal. Uh-huh. So um, that are spent on public education. The point is that a lot of that goes to fixed costs and necessary costs. There's very, very little surplus. In fact, there's the opposite of surplus. There are deficits. So that when a private foundation comes in and offers $40 million for this or $200 million for that, that's extra money. And I think it's um, proven by sociological theory that discretionary money is where policy is shaped. And so what the foundations are offering is really discretionary money. It's, it's, well, it's extra money, but it's not discretionary because the foundations make sure that it's spent in a particular way. Um, and the final thing that I want to say in response is uh, the long list of um, things that past philanthropists have done that a lot of people, certainly not everyone, of course, would applaud. And I really tried to emphasize in my presentation that I think this is a new breed of philanthropists and a new breed of foundations. 
And I don't think any current philanthropist can rest on the laurels of what previous philanthropists have done. I th don't think that that's um, sound reasoning. But I do want to emphasize that this group of philanthropists that's involved in ed reform is just culturally different and to some extent uh, structurally different. Okay, so now I wanted, I wanted to ask, answer the other Rick's question, which was... What are the policy implications of, of what you've been saying? I mean, uh, sh uh, how should, should foundations be governed differently than they are today? Okay, in uh, one of my articles, actually, the last, one of the last ones called um, Plutocrats at Work, How uh, Big Philanthropy Undermines Democracy, not a neutral title. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clear title. It's, it's a good clear. Thing. It's clear. It's good. Um, I talked a lot about reform of um, the laws, especially the tax laws around pri uh, private foundations, that I think would be necessary. For example, that there would private foundations above a certain size wouldn't be tax exempt at all. I, I don't really think that the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, or any of these others need their tax exemptions. Um, I think that small foundations need tax exemptions in order to do their work. There were other things like um, there's a 5% minimum payout that uh, private foundations have to make every year. This is 5% of their endowments. But uh, the big loophole here is that they can include all of their administrative expenses for running the foundations. That means if um, all of the trips, all of the forums, all of the travel, all of the new buildings that are built, that can be take out, taken out of that money. It encourages a very rich to be mild, lifestyle on the part of wealthy foundations. There's no reason for taxpayers to subsidize that. They can spend their own money if they want to on that. So those were some of the kinds of uh, legal and structural um, reforms. But I think that Rick is getting at um, also on policy questions. I think there are there's one rule that philanthropy should consider very seriously, which is do no harm. Now, this, of course, is an impossible rule because it gets into motivation, and they don't think they're doing harm. They're doing good. But it means that they have to be very, very careful about listening to criticism and very carefully um, and, and self-critically looking at what they're doing. In terms of the ed reformers, I would say this. Um, if I could redirect all of their money, uh, I would say teacher evaluation is extremely important, and perhaps the teachers' unions have did not get on top of this as early as they should have. But that there are programs that have been developed by teachers and principals at the school level called peer um, advise and review, assessment and review, thank you. Assistance. Yes, peer assistance and review, thank you very much. This is the right audience to make that mistake. Um, and uh, these are programs which operate um, usually at individual school levels. and. They've been extraordinarily successful. The first ones began close to 30 years ago. So it's well tested, although it's not well, um, it's not well spread. If I could spend all of the foundation money, I would make sure that every single public school in the United States had a good uh, PAR system in place. And I think that this would do a tremendous amount in terms of raising the quality of teaching where it needs to be raised. The other thing that I would do is I would go back to funding, as Carnegie did in the case of the public libraries, I would go back to funding brick and mortars. I would make sure that every public school in the United States has a functioning bathroom. 
that they have enough toilet paper, that there are no cockroaches, that there are no rats. I would make sure that they serve decent fu uh, food in the cafeterias. There are too many public schools in the United States that don't have the money to do that. And if I had money, that's where I would put it. Good. Thanks, Rick. Uh, sure. I mean, I think on the policy point, you know, I mean, frankly, uh, you, you, you know the the uh, the tax the, the tax exemption for uh, charitable giving and, and foundation rules were put in the tax code what almost a century ago uh, in order to try to stimulate the proliferation of private organizations institutions that we haven't seen in the U.S. and you know we're largely unique around the world. Not nobody in Europe, for instance, has anything like what we have, and therefore you don't see. Uh, the same kind of lattice work of civil organizations and civil society institutions. Um, I think it works reasonably well. I think it's got enormous problems. Um, it doesn't work reasonably well. It's got enormous problems. Uh, I, I just have no confidence uh, that I would actually like what came out of the changes any better, and I think I'd like it worse. Um, the one interesting thing I'd like to see us talk about is, you know, I actually have the opposite uh, concern from Joanne about foundations uh, when the donor passes away. Uh, is that I, th I find, you know, I, I, I think historically um, it's been fascinating to watch some of these legacy foundations operate for decades and decades after the after the uh, after the, the the initial donor passed away, in which they wind up getting taken over by boards of directors and professionals, um, and these things can wander enormously from donor intent. So I, I, I kind of like the idea, for instance, of saying that, you know, in order uh, to get your, your full, uh, you know, in order to get your full favorable treatment on the tax code, uh, that foundations have to have a spend down clause, that they're going to spend themselves out of existence, for instance, within a decade of the passing of the donor. I think that's, an, I don't know that it's a good idea. Um, we haven't really thought through all the implications, but it's something I'd certainly like to see. Uh, just a couple, um, a couple quick responses, a couple things, uh, Joanne, just read. One is, Actually, let me, just, let me just keep it to, to, to one thing. Um, that so much of, you know, the, 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 there's a reason, I, I would argue, that foundations got away from just giving to bricks and mortar um, and from just giving to districts. And it was actually, right, it was, taught, it was addressed at length in kind of this Best of Attentions book I did a decade ago, which was a lot of the impetus for kind of the modern foundation giving was a backlash against the Annenberg experience. Uh, the Annenberg experience was kind of the high watermark of a really committed, nice, rich person. So in this case, Ambassador Walter Annenberg giving $500 million at a Rose Garden cer ceremony, uh, with, you know, gleaning uh, $600 million in matching funds. So he had a $1.1 billion gift to the Annenberg sites over a limited period of time. And it was loosey-goosey. It was stuff that, you know, whatever the local committees actually liked, uh, it was enthusiastically supported by many of the folks who criticized today's giving. Um, it was put into schools without driving much in any systemic uh, manner. Um, and it was generally regarded by most people who looked at it as having made no difference whatsoever. And this is kind of what Jay Green talked about in an essay in that book back then. It's kind of this buckets into the sea phenomena. When all K-12 philanthropy nationally adds up to maybe a fraction of a penny of what you're spending. When Mark Zuckerberg gives $100 million to Newark with another $100 million match to be paid out over four years, and it only amounts to about 4.5% of, uh, uh, of annual outlays by Newark for a four-year window, and that's the biggest concentrated gift in the history of the country, you're just not going to drive meaningful change in how these systems are serving kids through individual brick and mortar or one-off donations. Now, one theory of action is that policy cannot play a constructive role. I think that theory of action is wrong. Um, so what you see with modern foundations, and one reason that they are going about their work uh, in the manner they are, is because I think they rightly intuit that any of their other investments are going to amount to a waste of time and money unless they change the policy context in which schools and systems are operating. Now, 
I think they're putting too much faith in how far policy can take you, personally. Um, I think they are sometimes naive about which policy levers to pull. Um, but I think the... Uh, I, I think the strategic decision to get involved in policy and advocacy was a smart one. I think it was on balance the right one. And while I am happy to kind of criticize specifics of what they're doing and talk about tactics, um, I think it's both understandable and appropriate on balance. Okay, do we have um, questions from the audience? Yes, so if you can use the mic and please identify yourself. Identify myself, hi. Um Hi, I'm Donald Collins, University of Maryland, University College. I have a question for the panel in general. Um, I don't want, I feel like that in the most, in the discussion that followed the immediate talks of the two of you, that we've gone away a little bit from really the end product, so to speak, of what, or the end user, so to speak, of what we've been talking about today, which in this case happened to be parents and kids, the millions of parents and kids, particularly kids of low income and of color, um, that are part of this process of ed reform or poverty sort of investments that private philanthropy has been making over the last, say, decade, decade and a half. Um, and sort of, so my question really is, it's sort of like the two, it's, it's, it's not really a dichotomy that you two are talking about. I think there's some agreement between the two of you that some there, this philanthropy might be erring too much on the side of trying to control the situation, right? <laughs> Um, so my question to you really is around this whole issue of um, at what point can we make private philanthropy be more of a partner and working with communities and working with parents and working with teachers and quite frankly working with kids because that's the end product we're talking or the end client we're really talking about here. And as someone who grew up, and, and, re and the reason I'm asking this question is because as someone who grew up in poverty, grew up in poverty, grew up um, without the kinds of opportunities, so to speak, that are supposed to be in K-12 education, with education sort of being the great equalizer. And now to see what's going on over the last decade, decade and a half, in terms of private investments and private philanthropy, it seems to me that a lot of what's going on um, really has a complete lack of understanding of the situation that kids and parents are dealing with in terms of going through this whole process from birth until graduation or even moving on to college and so on and so forth. So my question to you is, is in what ways can we make private philanthropy more responsive? And so in some. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think I would say that when you talk to folks these philanthropies, they would argue that they absolutely share your premise that they believe it's vital to be responsive, and they'd say that's what they're working really hard to do right now. So I mean, so that's a matter of, uh, but but I, I think it's it's also easy for us in all of these conversations to kind of look at the world from our station and who we talk to and what we see. Um, so I think it's important, for instance, to, you know, parent revolution looks one way uh, if you're talking to folks who are uh, skeptical of what they're trying to do. Uh, when you talk to parent revolution, when you talk to some of the parents involved, um, though that $14 million is entirely an investment in trying to mobilize and work with communities and parents who want to change what's going on in their schools. And the legislative piece of that which I have issues with, and uh, which I've written about in some cases, um, the legislative strategy is about trying to empower those parents and communities. Um, now, one can disagree again about strategy, one can dis but I, I think this is the place where if we're willing to postulate that people do agree that that is an important piece of this, and that we might then have disagreements about whether their tactics reflect how you would encourage them to go about it, um, I think you will actually find um, foundations are much more receptive to hearing that feedback. Often that criticism gets put to them, not by people who say, we get that you're interested in trying to partner with communities and kids and parents, but people who say, why don't you want to partner with communities and kids and parents? And they go, we actually do, and we think we are, and the conversation becomes a dead end. Okay, I, I would say two things in answer to this question, which I think is a great question. Um, first, part of my critique of this 
uh, these personal foundations is that they are too top down. They're too top down with the nonprofits that they work for, and they're too top down with the communities that they want, they claim that they want to be helping. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, I don't think that there's enough direct involvement in terms of of micro help of what's really needed in these communities. I think there's too much emphasis on some grand systemic change that they want to um, enact from the top down. But probably more importantly um, is the issue is the fundamental issue of kids doing poorly in school. And why is that? Is it because the schools are so bad? No, it is because kids arrive at kindergarten or at preschool not prepared at the same level to learn. The actual real problem is to make sure that every child in the United States arrives at kindergarten ready to learn at a good level. The implications of this are tremendous. They are, they go back to, they, they go back in terms of where you begin to intervene prenatally. So that we have to consider questions of poverty. Poverty is a, what do you call, it's an explosive issue in this whole debate because the ed reformers will say, of course poverty matters, but we think that good schools can can solve the prop can make up for the problem of poverty once kids are in school, and I think that the overwhelming evidence is that that doesn't happen. Um, various researchers have shown that the gap, um, the achievement gap between low income and minority kids and white middle class kids, is there when the kids start school. And it doesn't get any bigger. It doesn't get any worse. Um, it just stays the same. So the, de the problem is to deal with that preparation gap. And that involves, it involves um, health care. It involves housing. It involves um, how people parent. And it involves um, what goes on in the home. It, go involves what go it involves what goes on in the neighborhood. And we might be making more progress if that's where the attention was focused. Uh, Joan Barrett Snowden. Um, I have a, a question. Rick, you, you talked about uh, Annenberg, and it came to nothing. Well, to me, that at least meets Joanne's uh, criteria of do no harm. <laughs> and you talk about cacophony in democracy and she describes the difference in how philanthropies are behaving now. Philanthropies didn't put one of their people uh, on Arnie Duncan's floor to help with, for free, with uh, the rules for school improvement, which they have done now. So my question to you, and you use the example of the school boards, isn't that wonderful democracy? Well, when Bloomberg sits in New York and sends you know, $200,000 to a local school board race across the country, I, I'm wondering whether this isn't really just another example of how um, money can pollute the democratic process and also well, I have no question about the um, best intentions. Uh, I finished last night The Brothers, a book about Alan and John Foster Dulles. They had the best of intentions. We have Vietnam, we have Middle East, we have all of that because of their good intentions. How do we protect ourselves from the good intentions? and yet enjoy the possibility of what philanthropy can contribute to us? Yeah, so I think these are great questions. Um, one, I mean, you know, th there are always these debates about the role of money in politics. Um, I'm of the school of thought that, um, that you know, that, that American politics has always been a sordid, ugly mess. 
and that people who try to clean it up ultimately uh, generally are enormously frustrated and I think many times frequently do more harm than good. For instance, uh, you know, the teacher unions have certainly allowed out-of-state money uh, to play a role when they were involved in the uh, Governor Walker recall in Wisconsin or fighting the Draper Amendment in California. That it wasn't like they said, hey, we should only spend California dollars if we're fighting the Draper Amendment in California, that it's okay for those dollars. And I think it's the same thing. If, you know, when one is fighting uh, for gun laws, um, I hear very, re relatively few of my progressive friends complaining when Michael Bloomberg is giving lots of money to support efforts to tighten gun laws in states in which he does not reside. That that is part and parcel of the way that these debates play out. And I don't think the rules, uh, that the rules for education reform ought to be any different. And I think it is a messy, putrid, horrible, frustrating system. I just don't know of any that's, yeah. Um, so so that's, that, that's that, that, that point. Um, and you, you, had a, you had a second point, John, I'm sorry, um, which was, just give me a, a word or two about, oh, good intentions. Yeah, I, th oh, I think that's totally fair. Um, God knows. I mean, I think, you know, we wind up driving our, you know, doing more harm uh, in so many ways out of, you know, out of enormously good intentions. Um, you know, I mean, this is one of the funny things about the Affordable Care Act. I think Affordable Care Act for its very bad policy for the country but I don't for a moment think that the president had bad intentions or anybody who supported it had bad intentions. I just happen to disagree with their understanding of how the world works. Um, I think the reality is, is here again where I think, you know, I'm a Tocquevillian and where I think it's good for us to kind of go back to Madisonian teachings, um, that the best um, defense I know of and the one I trust most uh, to try to keep things in check uh, is not allowing people to make big sweeping decisions that are going to go into effect and leave us few out outs, that I'm personally somebody who likes lots of power centers, likes, th likes things to be incremental, likes things to constantly be debated and redebated and fought about again. And what are the checks then on these foundations doing harm? I think exactly the idea that when they are going to try to do the Met project, they're going to do it in four districts, and those four districts are going to, we're going to have years and uh, the Met team at Gates is going to do the evaluations, and those results will be published, and they will be subjected to scrutiny, and folks are going to push back. And, you know, Tom Kane will then try to make the case again. And, frankly, people who say, you know, p people who want a sweeping solution, whether it's peer assistance, which I think works terrific in Montgomery County, but pretty atrociously in a lot of other places I've seen it, um, or whether it is the idea that, you know, that we need to do turnarounds or school improvement grants or something else. Um, you know, uh, people call me in a conservative, and I'm a conservative in the sense that I, I think our eyes are often enormously bigger than our stomachs. And my favorite check against these people's good intentions accidentally doing a lot more harm than they need to is limiting the amount of good or harm that anybody's going to do in any limited period of time. And that requires a degree of patience that we don't always have. Can I press you on this, and then we'll come to, come to your question. Um, one thing that strikes me about the, union, the, the, the foundations as kind of a counterbalance to, to union power that you're talking about is that somehow the, when the foundations weigh in, it's, it's seen as, as high-minded. Uh, I'll just give you a parochial example. Um, as, as we were talking about all these foundations, when I wrote the Shanker biography, I got money from the Broad Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, I did not take money from the AFT, or I wasn't offered money, but I, I, um, <laughs> I, I didn't pursue that because uh, I thought, and, and people advised me, that that would be seen as tainted. But somehow taking money from, from Broad... Uh, and Hewlett, uh, which I'm very grateful for, um, <laughs> w was not. And I'm wondering if there's a, why that uh, double standard exists. So I, I, th I, think that, I, think it's, I think there's two things. Um, I think it's a general phenomenon. Um, that, that, that one, uh, the giving for self-interest. So for instance, um, Jeff Hennig at Columbia and I have been interested in taking another crack at this Best of Intentions book because the world has changed. Um, foundations are enormously weary uh, to give money to study foundations. Partly because, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. One of which, though, is that when you're giving money to something that's, when you're the subject, 
Um, so I think that is a more general true phenomenon. But two, I think it's I think it's absolutely fair to say that unions have generally been seen as more suspect in the in the NCLB era, and these foundations is less so. I, again, this is one reason I think it would be fun to look at how the media has portrayed this stuff in the last three, four years. I would argue that that balance has changed. Is the foundations have been less new and more an established part of the landscape, and as they, they have come under more sustained criticism um, in the public space, that I think Gates is much less regarded as kind of the white knight than it was, say, five or ten years ago. Um, and I think that you've seen uh, some changing valence, for instance, in the, in the New York State debates, um, about the way uh, the, the AFT and the, uh, and, and the NEA are, are kind of commonly regarded in some of this. So I think it's less a, 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 a uh, you know, an unalterable rule, and I think it's more um, something that's cyclical. And I think these foundations in five or ten years are going to be are going to be regarded somewhat differently than they were regarded five or ten years ago. I just I just want to add one comment. This is just in response to this Rick's um, comment about not doing big sweeping changes limiting the damage by not doing something that's too large. For me, one of the problems um, with the current ed education reform movement is that their experiments um, are too large. So when Gates um, undertook the small schools project, according to their website, they affected close to 900,000 students. That's a lot of students. That's much, much too big. Um, I could support certainly pilot projects that were very small, that went on for enough time, that were based not on partisan research, but on really good independent research, and to see what the results are. And if the results are good, then I think scaling up has to be a democratic decision. I also think that when um, the results are not good, that the foundations have to clean up their messes, which they haven't done so far. Um, my name's Connie McKenna, and I work here at the AFT, and I came today just because I'm interested. I don't know uh, much about how philanthropies operate, but I've we've heard from both of you how it's clear to philanthropies that they need to be more open to criticism. Um, and Dr. Hess, I'm curious since you're an insider, you know, as a, as a union person, we're always looking for structures that support our goals. Um, what kinds of structures, what are the mechanics inside um, philanthropic foundations that drive that, um, that information collection from the outside? Because, of course, it seems to most of the world that those doors are closed. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. And I think it's important to recognize, too, that, I mean, many of these foundations we're talking about, for instance, have supported the AFT. Um, certainly, Ann Bradley's Innovation Fund has been supported by some of this, but also some of AFT's partnerships and such. Um, so w one thing to keep in mind is that these foundations are actually somewhat varied. Uh, the Gates Foundation is an enormous, guys, an enormous bureaucracy at this point. <laughs> uh, it's got something like 1,400 people working at Gates. Um, it, you, dealing with Gates is a lot like dealing with U.S. Department of Education at this point. Um, there's different fiefdoms. People don't know each other. There's lo um, the Walton Foundation is a very different story. Walton Founda Family Foundation is a couple dozen people. Um, so the way in which they interact and how they collect data and how they process stuff internally, very different. Uh, on the other hand, something like uh, the Joyce Foundation um, is you know, much smaller, much more focused, much more distanced. Uh, from some of these. So, so one is just understanding that these foundations are not kind of similar, at least how they regard themselves and think about their role. Um, and a second is what I, internally, most of them are structured in a way that's going to feel, I think, somewhat familiar uh, to, to folks, for instance, who work at the AFT, which is there is leadership and they establish kind of organizational direction um, and they do it in partnership with by trying to hear feedback from the folks they work with and their, their grantees in the field, uh, and they have boards of advisors. Um, but they do settle on a direction, and then there's kind of a senior staff, and then depending on how big and attenuated those organizations are, it works down to the junior folks that you're most likely to deal with. Um, now, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, just to direct a little, redirect, the comparison's difficult for us because 
all of the people, it's all driven by elections yeah. at the ground level. Okay. No, that's so what not- I'm curious about are the, the mechanics. So I'm hearing that it's different from foundation to foundation, which makes sense. By mechanics, so give me an example of what you mean by mechanics. Well, if you want to hear from people on the street, how do they do that? So, you know, so one problem is... is and they- parents, of course... And with kids in public schools, because um, so you know, so I mean, so they do lots of you know, kind of familiar outreach. But you know, when you get uh, twenty parents in a room and to talk to you, it's kind of like I'd imagine when you're asking them on what policies should the AFD support. What parents want to talk about is their frustration with the grading policy and the snow days and the school pickup times. And you're like, okay, well, that doesn't necessarily feed a lot into kind of AFT strategic direction. Same thing for these foundations. If what you're trying to talk about is policy changes or programmatic direction, um, what they really want to hear from are people who have specific useful suggestions or criticisms or whatever that can help inform the way they're going about their work. The problem is um, they talk to people who agree with them a lot. The people they're funding, they bring in researchers and experts, and these people will give them kind of nudges. But the real question is, how do they hear from people who disagree with them? And the problem is, and those of you who, like, say, spend any time reading the blogs and all know that a lot of people who disagree with them quickly go to, I think, really really hostile language. Uh, They tend, you know, unlike Joanne, to be, I think, very skeptical of their motivations. They tend to call them corporate reformers and suggest that they're trying to undermine these communities and make a buck off. And I got to tell you, if I'm a foundation official and I hear somebody saying that about me, I don't think that they're actually very interested in giving me constructive or useful feedback. So I'm not very inclined to reach out to them. And if they do write me a note, I'm, I'm really hesitant to spend much time with them because they haven't shown any evidence that they're actually serious or interested in kind of taking me, stipulating that I might be a decent person and helping me get smarter about the work I'm doing. So I think this goes back to kind of our question before about if you disagree with the way they're engaging parents or communities, if you disagree with how, what happens is this stuff is, is very much be partly because of the nature of digital communication, become these depersonalized, very hostile, um, very aggrieved online assaults, which don't do anything to kind of open those conversations. Um, I think most of these foundations would actually be very happy uh, to hear feedback from the AFT and hear from teachers about how their stuff's playing out and suggestions how they could do it better. Um, If it was framed in that way, that, look, guys, we might disagree about some stuff, but we know that what you, you you know, you're you're trying, you think what you're doing is helpful. And we don't want to kind of disparage you, but we'd love a chance to sit down. Try that. And if they don't, if they don't respond kind of a way that says, all right, well, we're open to kind of sitting down here. You say, let me know. And I am happy to try to help them and be facilitated there. But I think they, I think they very rarely get that kind of outreach from people who are critical. Thank you. I think I, I would just point out this, that the AFT in particular, I think, has tried to work um, with the foundations, in particular Gates. But someone from the union leadership would have to talk about how that's been going. The question for you guys, mostly just because it's in the title of this conversation. Can, can you identify yourself? Well, uh, Kevin Hess, I work with the Colorado League of Charter Schools grad school oh sorry um so my main question i think just because everyone in this room has a different idea of what democracy and education means um you know i think voucher in mind i think vouchers are very democratic because you're voting with your feet but i think everyone has a different view on that there are limitations to like traditional democracy as in voting um in Denver, we're still under a consent decree from 1980s, the middle of 1980s, for ESL learners because they realized that the ESL program was bad because their parents didn't vote. They weren't citizens. So my question to you is, what does democracy and education mean to you? Like, what, it, what does it actually mean? Who, who are the stakeholders? Who votes? Who decides where do the ideas come from? Hmm. That's either a very huge question or a teeny one. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, 
democracy and education. First, let me say that I think that a strong public education system is vital to democracy. I don't think you have a strong, healthy democracy without a strong, healthy public education system. Um, I oppose vouchers now because I think that they drain money away from public schools into the direction of private schools. Um, there's actually a lot to be said, for me not in favor, but there's still a discussion to be had about a system of education that would be completely vouchers, but that might be a, a topic for discussion another time. Um, I prefer elected school boards to mayoral control. And I think that's one way to make sure that the public has input into the public education system. And that includes parents as well, especially parents um, and teachers. Um, what does democracy mean in education? I think, I think there's too much emphasis in this current education reform movement, and I think that this goes all the way up to President Obama, to consider education as simply a pathway for employment. If you have a better education, you get a better job, you earn more money. I think that's much too limited a way of looking at education. I think that the public schools um, have many tasks, and beyond teaching, reading, and writing, and arithmetic, there is the formation of good citizens, good citizens, which has to do with an understanding of what democracy is. It has to do with also learning to, criti uh, to think critically so that you can be a good citizen. I think that now the education reform movement has made the concept of education much too narrow for what is needed for a democracy. So, um, so, so first, I think uh, just, uh, so, so two thoughts. One kind of where Joanne came out is I think this is a place where we totally talk past each other all the time. Um, I don't know. I don't know anybody in the school reform camp um, who doesn't disagree with Joanne want, you know, with uh, Joanne's kind of vision of what schools should do. I don't know anybody at any of these advocacy groups or foundations who doesn't want kids to be citizens, doesn't want kids to be engaged uh, in their communities, doesn't want kids to be developed as artists and musicians. The reason that they play such a high degree of focus on reading and math is because they are concerned that these children are in poverty in particular are coming to school, are not literate or numerate. We are finding it too easy to make excuses for why we're not getting them where they need to be and that they are being shut out from all these other opportunities. This is a, there is an absolutely reasonable and kind of tough-minded argument that we need to be having. But to imagine that anybody, because Anybody in this debate somehow only wants schools to be factories of reading and math so kids can get jobs is, I think, to do a massive disservice um, to people who have spent a lot of time and energy pushing for school accountability and, you know, value added and the rest. Um, the democracy, look, uh, Albert Hirschman years ago wrote, uh, you know, what, four decades ago now, wrote this wonderful book, Exit Voice and Loyalty. Uh, and for me, um, you know, D d democracy, uh, you know, it's too bad Barbara's not here because he's the theorist, you know. My, my, my PhD is in political science, but, you know, not, not, not theoretical political science, um, kind of understanding, you know, why Congress doesn't vote for base closure commissions. Um, look, f for me, there's two ways to think about how democracy plays out. One is the ability of families to make choices for their children, families to opt out of programs which they find religiously offensive, the opportunity of families to send their child to schools that are consistent with their ideals, but respectful with, the, with what it means to be a member of the American community. Respect for the Constitution, respect for our neighbor's rights, and the rest. Um, and a second part of what democracy means to me is the opportunity to use voice for citizens to speak up and to vote for who they want for school board or legislature for people to go and speak in public forums and be heard in hearings and to organize and mobilize. 
And I, or I honestly have no earthly idea what the right mix of any of this is. Um, my general attitude is, is that, you know, more is better, but there's trade-offs, and so it gets very complicated. My biggest fear, like I wrote about, God, 13 years or something ago, and fight out the cap now on this, is what frustrates me is when we use definitions of public education or democratic education as a way to delegitimize or silence people we happen to disagree with, rather than kind of ask this question and see whether or not they just have a different notion of what democratic involvement and expanding the democratic sphere means from what we do. And for me, so that's the challenge. That I think philanthropy has generally served to expand the playing field on the democratic debate. Um, there are times when it does not. And so for me, the question is not, is philanthropy good or bad in the whole when it comes to, democra to de democratic education, but how do we identify and encourage the fact, that, how do we recognize that it generally has been good, but there are moments when it is less good, and how do we address and think about those? I would point out, Rick, that uh, John Chubb and Terry Moe, uh, kind of the leading intellectuals behind vouchers, their central critique was that our system was too democratic, right? That we need to move away from that. So that, that should well, be Well, but part except, of but this is actually the Hirschman thing, right? So they actually embraced exit at the expense of voice. And what I would say, which I think is entirely appropriate, is they, 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 they critiqued uh, participatory democracy. But if you ask Terry and John, do they think they are talking about a system of schooling which is less consistent with the American liberal democratic tradition? Mm -hmm. They would say absolutely not, that they see this as expanding the realm mm -hmm. of democratic freedom. Right. I, I imagine that, that Leo will have some thoughts on this question. I thought, um, given that the question of unions and what unions do in politics had been raised, um, it would perhaps be appropriate for me to to make a contribution um, to today's discussion. Um, I would say I agree with Rick Kess that um, American politics are ugly and sordid, um, but I would also say that the trajectory of American politics is to become consistently more ugly and more sordid. <laughs> um, and so um, certainly with the Citizens United decision, um, we have now not only massive amounts of of private wealth being used to influence politics, but we don't even get to know who it is that is contributing all of this private wealth um, to influence politics. And from the point of view of a union, um, in a country where political spending before Citizens United um, was about 20 to one business to union, um, from the point of view of a union, I think we would, in a nanosecond, um, do what the rest of the world does in democracies, which is have a system of public funding um, where private money doesn't actually pay uh, a role in, in the political process, and so that it becomes a lot closer to this ideal that we have of one person, one vote. Um, and I would say, simply to connect that to, to today's discussion, I think there's a context um, that, that worries some of us about the role of philanthropy. And that is that in the American political system, um, there has been this incredible outsized influence of private wealth in a way that's not true of any other democracy in the world. And so what we worry about when we see uh, philanthropies moving into education um, in this sort of extraordinary way that they do, um, whether this is not just one more manifestation um, of private wealth having an outsized influence um, on what should be a public system um, dedicated to the common good. Terrific. Well, well uh, it's two o'clock, so unless the, either of you have anything to add, uh, Leo, I think you put it very nicely. Uh, thank you all for coming. Absolutely. Enjoy.